Your brain, this incredible three pound organ that controls everything from your thoughts and emotions to your heartbeat and movements, is also one of the most delicate structures in your body. This squishy mass of neurons and supporting cells needs some serious protection because even a minor bump could lead to some major damage. But luckily, your brain is equipped with an impressive fortress of defenses. Most people know that our tough bony helmet that we call the skull provides protection for the brain, but this actually isn't enough on its own. So today, we're gonna to talk about everything the brain needs to protect itself. Yes, we'll touch on the skull, but we'll also learn about these other essential membranes that surround and protect the brain even further, as well as the fluid that surrounds and protects the brain and where it comes from. Plus, as a fun added bonus, we'll throw in some info about skull fractures bleeding into the brain and a potentially fatal infection of the surrounding brain tissues called meningitis. It's going to be a meningeal one. So let's jump into this anatomical and physiological awesomeness. So let's start with the outermost layer of protection, the skull. This isn't just one bone. It's a complex structure made up of 22 bones in adults, connected together by immovable joints called sutures. And you can see one of these incredible sutures coming up on top of the skull. Now, the skull forms a rigid case around your brain, shielding it from external impacts like falls or bumps, or that time you accidentally headbutted your friend. And what's cool about the skull is its design. Yes, it's thick and strong in certain areas, like you can see the thickness on this sagittal head section, but it also has openings for nerves and blood vessels, and these holes are called foramina. And an example of a really large hole, you can see this right here called the foramen magnum, which is the large hole at the base of your skull where the brain stem connects with the spinal cord. And just a little side note, I need to give a quick shout out to Jason Silvers and his father who donated this skull to our lab. Thank you, Jason. We'll do our best to continue this educational legacy that your father was a part of. Now, the skull absorbs and distributes force during impacts, preventing direct trauma to the brain tissue. But like I mentioned earlier, this isn't enough. Imagine if the brain was just sitting inside the skull with nothing else to support it, and you start shaking your head around all aggressively like at a rock concert. Your brain would just be slapping around in here, contacting different parts of the skull, which would be bad. And this is where the surrounding protective membranes come in, called the meninges. Meninges means membranes, and the meninges are three membranous layers that surround the brain and spinal cord, acting like a multi-layered shield. They provide support, protection, and create passageways for cerebral spinal fluid to flow through. And we'll learn more about the CSF in just a minute. But like I said, there are three layers that make up the meninges, the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. And we have a really cool dissection that I'm going to show you by removing the skull cap off of this cadaver. But before I show you the meningeal layers that protect the brain, did you know that creatine can actually improve your brain's cognitive performance? And that's where the sponsor of today's video comes in, Create. These guys created the first creatine monohydrate gummy, which is awesome for multiple reasons. One, they use the highest quality of Creapure creatine monohydrate, which has been third-party tested for quality. Plus, they taste great, as they come in flavors like blue raspberry or sour green apple, which has actually been a little bit of a problem at my house because people keep getting into my stash of creatine gummies. But once you get past your family thievery and treachery, you can revel in the joy of how convenient these gummies are. No need to mix it in with a drink or shake. You can just pop a few of them into your oral cavity and chew them up, which I especially love when I go out of town. I no longer have to pack a whole bottle of creatine or transfer it into a little Ziploc bag. Now I've been taking creatine for years now, and I talk a lot about it with patients and friends, and I find very few reasons for people not to be supplementing with creatine, because this isn't just about your muscles anymore. Yes, it clearly helps improve exercise performance, but it can also improve cognitive function and even help with sleep deprivation. So if there is a high quality creatine product like Create, I can definitely support that. So if you're interested, go to trycreate.co slash humananatomy and use our coupon code humananatomy to get 30% off. That link will also be in the description below. And now let's get back to those brain wrappings. So right under the skull, you can see the toughest outermost layer, the dura mater. And dura means tough and mater means mother, so tough mother. The mother name comes from the old anatomist erroneously believing that all the tissues of the body arose from the meninges. They were wrong. 
but the name stuck, which I'm kind of glad about because it's just cool to be able to say tough mother. But this is a thick membranous membrane made up of dense irregular connective tissue, which is a tissue that is mostly made up of collagen fibers scattered in all directions. And it actually attaches to the inner surface of the skull, which you can see on this sagittal head section. But on this dissection, I had to actually peel it away when I initially performed the dissection. The duramater provides structural support and protects against mechanical stress. It also folds inward to create partitions like the falx cerebri that you can see here, which separates the two hemispheres of the brain, and the tentorium cerebelli, which divides the cerebrum from the cerebellum. This helps stabilize the brain and prevent excessive movement inside the skull. But remember, I teased earlier about some discussion on brain trauma. If say someone were to sustain a skull fracture, like right here, the fractured bone could cause tearing or rupturing of arteries, like this artery you can see here embedded in the dura mater called the middle meningeal artery. This could cause its bleeding between the skull and the dura, leading to an epidural hematoma. Epa means a pawn and a hematoma is a blood-filled swelling. And because this is often due to arterial bleeding, blood can build up fast, causing pressure to build up on top of the brain, leading to headache, confusion, or even coma if not treated quickly. And surgeons might need to drill into the skull to relieve the pressure. Next up, we have the arachnoid mater, named for its spiderweb-like appearance. This is a thinner, more delicate layer that does not adhere directly to the dura. And you can actually see me peel it away from the sagittal head dissection. But on this dissection, you can see it collapsed down on the brain. But even though it doesn't attach directly to the dura, in a living person, it would be pushed up closer to the dura because underneath the arachnoid mater is a space called the subarachnoid space filled with cerebral spinal fluid, which again, we're gonna cover some very fascinating info on CSF in just a second. But the arachnoid acts as another membrane barrier, helping to cushion the brain and maintain a stable environment. And we have another potential injury to discuss. Remember earlier, we learned about an epidural hematoma, which is bleeding on top of the dura or between the dura and the skull. But you can also get bleeding below the dura, so between the dura mater and the arachnoid mater. And this is called a subdural hematoma. And this is most often due to venous tears or tears in veins, usually in older adults from milder head trauma. And because this is typically from venous tears, the bleeding tends to build up more slowly than the epidural hematomas, but can still cause symptoms like headache, weakness, or seizures over days or weeks. And again, may still require drilling into the skull to relieve the pressure. The innermost layer is the pia mater, which translates to delicate mother. This is a super thin and vascular layer that attaches to the outside surface of the brain and hugs every fold and contour and groove that you can see on the brain's surface. But you can't really differentiate this from the actual brain tissue with the naked eye, except for this glistening look that you can see on the outside surface of the brain. And just so you know, we've cut a little window into the arachnoid so you could see at least where the pia would be attaching to. The pia is packed with small blood vessels and supplies nutrients and oxygen directly to the brain tissue and also helps anchor the brain slightly within the meninges. Now, what is really cool about understanding this anatomy, well, it's not really cool for anyone who gets this illness that we're about to talk about, but because we understand this anatomy, this will help us to understand meningitis, which translates to inflammation of the meninges. The most serious form of meningitis, bacterial meningitis, is when bacteria enters into the subarachnoid space and infects these inner meningeal layers, the arachnoid mater and the pia mater. The typical symptoms include fever, headache, stiff neck, and changes in mental status. And this is a very serious infection. From its original recognition in 1805 until the early 1900s, bacterial meningitis from either of these two bacteria Haemophilus influenzae or Streptococcus pneumoniae was virtually 100% fatal. But since the advent of antibiotics in the 1930s, this has dramatically decreased the mortality rate. But unfortunately, even today, if people aren't treated promptly, they can still die or have long-term adverse effects from bacterial meningitis. And finally, let's talk about the cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF, which fills the subarachnoid space between the arachnoid and pia pretty much allowing your brain to float in its own personal jacuzzi within your skull, reducing the brain's effective weight 
by about 95% through buoyancy and acting as a shock absorbing hydraulic cushion so your brain doesn't splat back and forth against your skull while headbanging at that rock concert. CSF is actually derived from the blood, but it's clear and pretty much looks like water. So you have these specialized capillaries called choroid plexuses located within the hollow spaces of your brain called ventricles, which you can see one of the ventricles or hollow spaces on this cadaver dissection. And here is a choroid plexus. And these choroid plexuses kind of act like a filter for the blood essentially only allowing the watery portion and other select substances to pass through from the blood. But this is essentially how your body protects its most delicate and arguably most important structure, the brain, through a nice thick skull, meningeal membranes, and cerebrospinal fluid. So hopefully you learned some cool and useful information today. Thank you for watching and supporting our channel, everyone. And of course, we'll see you in the next video.